Okay, uh, I think before we start the show, please allow me to just spend a few minutes to share with you uh, why we are having this Grey Rhino show. Okay, as you all know, now we are going through a very extraordinary period of our life. Okay, firstly, of course, that is the most memorable or rather the longest working from home experience that I personally have. Uh, I bet maybe many of you are the same as well. But at the same time, we are also seeing a COVID-led economic slump. And my guess is that uh, it's so extraordinary that I think maybe Mr. Warren Buffett also hasn't seen it before. After this session, let me just drop him a text to check with him to confirm that. Um, so there's just so much unknown lying ahead of us and nobody knows when this is going to end. Could it be tomorrow? Could it be in one month's time? Could it be one year's time? Don't know. Maybe, maybe only a magic ball will know. But since we don't have any magic ball on hand right now, right? So I think the least we can do is just to follow this historical event. So no doubt with whatever that is happening now, yeah, I saw Victor Ku. Yeah, cannot be tomorrow. Yes, that's my fat hope. Thanks. So with whatever that's happening now, probably there are people who are going through um, some pain of not being able to invest or don't know what to invest or even the pain of uh, not being able to go out. But actually, this also presents opportunity to many of us. So of course, today we are not here to follow COVID. I think the update of COVID, right, our government has been updating us on a very, very regular basis. So rather, we are look, here to look at how will, this market, uh, how will this market react in this crisis and then at the same time, what kind of opportunities are waiting for us. Okay, thanks Daniel. Stay invested and keep going in trenches. Okay, okay so why, why not just a Grey Rhino webinar, but we call it the Grey Rhino Show. I'm not sure whether you have heard of uh, this movie called The True Man Show. This film actually stars Jim Carrey. He, 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 I think he's, um, the character's name is True Man, True Man Burbank, something like that. So he was adopted and raised by a corporation inside a simulation television show. So basically, they follow his life in a real-time basis. So until he discovers it and then he decided to escape from it. I mean, that's the later part of the show, right? But... Uh, so that's why, that's what we want to do over this show as well. So it's not just going to be a one-time webinar. We want to hold a series on a bi-weekly basis so that we are able to share with you real-time market situation. And of course, we will also encourage you to take action in your life after the session with us. Okay. Uh, let me just share with you what is going to happen in the next one hour, okay, from eight to nine. We have our special speaker today, Kate Wee, okay, who will be going through an economic update, a market update, and also, um, so this will happen in the first half of the session. Then because we also want it to be a very practical, practical session for all of you to help you understand how we actually do market research for our clients. Therefore, the second part, second half of the session will be having a case study. So this case study, um, let me just see. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, uh, can I? Okay, thank you. So, um, so this case study, we, we will be sharing with you using one company that we do investment research in. So hopefully, you will be able to gain some insights. And then probably now in your mind, you have one question. So what if I have a question to ask? Not to worry, throughout the whole sharing by Kate B, let's say if you do have some question that pop out of your mind, okay? we will be able to accept those questions because at the end of the case study, we will be having a Q&A session. But uh, I hope to seek your understanding because 
we may not be able to answer all the questions that's being posted. If you look at the top right hand corner of your screen, if you click on the three dots right more, you should be able to see chat. So this chat is actually the function for you to key in your question. I will be the one who will be looking at the question and then um, depending on the time that we have, I'll be choosing a few questions for Kitby to be addressed to as well. So, um, but another thing is also to seek your understanding. We may not be, we may not be able to answer company specific questions. Like for example, eh, is company A to be investing now or is company B better? Uh, because I feel that this may require more time. Okay, but not to worry. If you do have such question, we will also take into serious consideration for our upcoming session. Because like what I mentioned earlier on, this is going to be a series. So please continue to stay with us throughout the series on a bi-weekly basis if you do enjoy uh, our insights and our communication with you. Okay, um, without further ado, let me introduce you to our one and only speaker today. So, um, Kate Wee. Kate Wee is the head of investment of Unicorn. What makes him the head of investment? I think other than his passion in investing, right? Uh, no, other than his passion in doing research, he is an authentic investor. He has been investing for the past 18 years. So he's investors themselves. Therefore, when he shares with you, what he see as a company that has got good value, I think very, very likely he himself has really invested in it. On top of that, um, currently he is uh, the key, one of the key persons in our investing committee and he helps to build current, the current total asset under management of Unicorn, which is currently at about 350 million. Besides that, he is also leading and coaching a, a team of nine researchers. So for Kate Wee, I've known him for 10 years. I've always admired him for his strong belief in doing the right things for our clients instead of just doing things right. And I'm sure as you get to know him more and more via following us in this series, I'm sure you will share the same sentiments as uh, me as well. Okay, I think you have had enough of me as a host for this session. Let me pass the baton to Kate Wee to kickstart this fruitful grey rhino show for today. Okay, can we please? Okay, uh, very good evening everybody. So very good to see all of you all uh, virtually. I heard we have about 200 over people joining us today, uh, which is great. Huh? Yeah, so I'd like to be, uh, yeah, I think like Shireen said, it is quite an extraordinary event that we're having this time, you know, it's a, it's a pandemic, yeah. So even Warren Buffett, who's 89 years old, said that, you know, this is something, I was, uh, something he's not seen before in his lifetime, for someone 89 years old, you know, let alone uh, people like us. Uh, so this is something that's happened the first time in the world. Yeah. And hence, I think, um, yeah, it's good to be following it. I mean, just for interest is one thing. I guess when we look back, this will be actually a historic moment in our life. Uh, yeah. And uh, just like we look back in 2008, yeah, financially, you know, it was a historic event yeah, where, where you can learn something from it and then get better from there. And that's what we want to do as well, yeah, to, to learn something from this uh, episode as well. And hence, because it's not going to be a one-time affair because this uh, COVID-19, but it's going to last a while more. How, how long more? Actually, nobody knows. Okay, but let me get started. I'll show my screen. Okay, anytime if you can't see my screen or you can't hear me, please just give me a shout uh, to actually share. You know, a lot of people think that, wow, the economy is bad or the stock market is bad. You know? They, they, they some can't, somehow think they are the same. Yeah, in fact, they are different. Okay, the economy and the, and the financial market are different. Uh, let me share an example. What is the economy? Actually, the economy is the total transaction that happens in the whole world. Yeah. So even as individuals, a lot of transaction goes through us. Yeah. For example, if I buy uh, uh, vegetables, you know, if I were to uh, buy rice, yeah, transaction goes through me. Yeah. So the economy, when there are a lot of transactions, yeah, we call it the economy is doing well. When there are less transactions, the economy is not doing well. Financial market, on the other hand, it, 
relating to companies. Yeah, two of the biggest market in the world, the equity market and the bond market. They are actually relating to companies. Yeah, the, the health of the companies, the profitability of the company. Yeah. So uh, they are usually quite closely linked. Yeah, because you know when the economy is doing well, then a lot of people will transact. Yeah, and that translates to the revenue of companies. But could it be a case that one do well and one don't? It's also possible. I'll give you an example. Yeah, for example, if I'm someone selling uh, potatoes, uh, but because I'm uh, so kind, I sell potatoes for five cents per potato. So a lot of transaction goes through me. You know, a lot of people come and buy from me and I sell a lot. But at the end of the day, I find that actually I'm not profitable yeah, because I sell it too cheaply. And hence, myself as a company, yeah, you will not be doing well because it's unprofitable. Yeah. So financial markets is made up of businesses, of companies. Yeah. Economies is made up of all our transactions in this world. Uh, so there's a difference. But I say there's a close link. Yeah. And the link being the, yeah, the, the transactions translates to revenue of companies. Uh, why am I sharing this? Yeah, because I like to share with you actually what's happening in the economy. To give you an update, yeah, what's happening to the economy and the financial markets. Let me start with the economy. Okay, so the, I guess all of us know the economy is not doing well. Yeah, because when we, have, when we have a coronavirus, basically we have a sudden stop. Because look at us as a proxy today. You know, we don't go out, we spend, I say we definitely spend a lot lesser. You know, we, we, don't, we, don't, we buy less things uh, and we're just at home. Yeah, we, we don't go and socialize, you know, we don't go for entertainment. Yeah, so definitely uh, the transactions in the world has reduced. Yeah, so uh, US just published its first quarter GDP number. Yeah, so the GDP is minus 4.8%. Yeah, later I'll show you what, where does 4.8% stands. Okay, but you got to remember that's still the first quarter. Yeah, and this thing really started uh, to be serious, right, end of the first quarter. Yeah, at the same time, because as companies uh, are not having businesses, yeah, so they don't need people. And then they lay off people. So today, the unemployment rate in the US, okay, maybe I share why I share the US. Uh, why don't I share Singapore? Okay, because US is currently the biggest uh, financial market in the world. Yeah. So I say they have the biggest impact on the global economy, the global financial markets. Yeah. Although it's further away than Singapore, yeah, where Singapore, you know, uh, well, it doesn't really contribute very much to the global economy. So I'm talking about US yeah, as a proxy for the world. Yeah, so today I'll say the layoff, you know, as you read the headline, yeah, so millions of layoff set to push unemployment rates to the highest level since Great Depression. Uh, Great Depression happened in 1929. Uh, so this was, even so as at, as at now, you know, we have uh, exceeded the unemployment level in the Great Recession in the 2007 to 2009. Yeah, and currently the unemployment rate in the US is about 15% and it's still climbing. Okay, let me show you some statistics. Okay, this is what I shared with you about the GDP. All right. So the GDP has contracted 4.8% annualized in the first quarter of 2020. So if you look at the orange bar, right, so I say the, well, definitely in the last 10 years, we've not seen something like that. We have to go back to the Great Recession uh, to see something as a, that contraction as large as this. Uh, but as I said, we've got to bear in mind this number is talking about the first quarter. You know, so I'll say the, the stock market really started to fall. Yeah. And this lock and start only in the end February. Yeah. So if you take Singapore, for example, but right, I'll say the most serious of this lockdown, which is currently happening, yeah, only happened, I say, yeah, probably towards the very end of first quarter of the start or the start of second quarter. Yeah. So the economic sudden stop, I think, in the second quarter will be even worse than the first quarter. Uh, we don't know the number, so I think it could be contracting by, my guess, around 10%. Uh, what is after that? Actually, as I say, nobody knows at this moment. But I can share with you some of my view, uh, some of my insights uh, into what may be coming. Okay? Uh, just look at some... Hello? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, the, just some of these numbers, you know, like auto sales, uh, it has declined. You know, by close to about 30 plus percent. Services, you know, it fell a lot more than 2008. 
Yeah. So, so I say that now it's like minus 10, but definitely a lot more than 2008. Similarly for business investments, uh, restaurants. Yeah. So all this has been falling off the cliff uh, in terms of the economy. Okay, then I'd like to share with you this, uh, yeah, the jobless claim rates. Okay, so 30 million Americans fought for a jobless claim in the past six weeks. How much, how, how significant is 30 million? Americans' working population is about 150. So 30% makes up about 20%. So just in the last six weeks, uh, one fifth of Americans' working population has fought for a jobless claim. So if you look at the line, the, the blue line, you know, that, that doesn't mark the edge of this, of the charts, you know. That is actually a spike up. So you can see this chart actually started from 1970 till today. But nothing is as significant as this in terms of the jobless claim. Uh, so as businesses come to a sudden stop, uh, the number of people who are being retrenched uh, has definitely been climbing up. And as you know, so from businesses, yeah, who doesn't have business, then now go to the so it's it's a it's a vicious cycle. So now they fire people, and now people out of job, they don't have salary, and they cannot consume. Uh, then that will fit into the businesses having even uh, worse revenue. Worst business. So that's how it's, it's like. Uh, so definitely, as I say, we've looked at economy. Um, I don't think we're out of the woods, uh, definitely. Uh, numbers are looking, I would say, terrible to say the least. Uh, so uh, that's why we have been having a lot of stimulus. But how about the financial markets? Let's take a look. Okay, firstly, I talk about the MSCI All World Index. Uh, this, I think, is a very good proxy for the whole world. Yeah, it basically measures uh, the stock markets yeah, of most of the major countries developed plus developing uh, from 1st of June January to today. But you can see that actually from the peak, so this, uh, this chart is actually from 1st Jan to today. Uh, so um, yeah, towards the end of February, the stock market started to fall off. Yeah, so it fell 40%. It reached the bottom on 23rd of March. Ever since it's been climbing, so it's up 22% since. Let's look at the US stock market, uh, represented by the S&P 500, over the same period, yeah, first January till today. Yeah, so the drop was also quite the same, you know, a decline of 34%. Also on the 23rd of March, the pivoting point was on that date. Yeah, so at the point it pivoted and it started to climb 28%. Uh, so that's the US stock market. Let's look at uh, the bond market. So the bond market also fell, uh, but usually bonds will fall less than the stock market. So the Barclays total, uh, Global Aggregate Total Return Index, this measures all the investment grade bonds, uh, be it from the government, um, the companies. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it measures that. Yeah. So it fell off, it also fell off very sharply. It fell 9%. The pivoting point is also very close. It was on 19th of March. And after that, it's been climbing 5%. Gold. Okay, gold also dropped off sharply. It dropped off 13%. The pivoting point was 19th of March. And after that, it climbed 17%. So you may, you may ask some questions. Actually, what is magical about 19th of March and 23rd of March? Why did the economy continue to flounder? Yet the financial market started to turn. Was that magic? Okay, so I said, uh, let me show the next slide. So clearly, right now, there's a disconnect yeah, between the economy and the financial markets. Yeah. So the economy continues to trend down. How did more? Uh, nobody knows. Yeah. However, the stock market has already been climbing. Uh, as I say, as I say just now at the start. At most time, economy, the economy and the stock market tend to have a similar direction. Yeah. So when the economy goes into a recession, the stock market don't tend to do well. Yeah. Then why is it this time around the economy is still fall, going south, but yet the stock market started to go north yeah, after the 19th and 23rd of March. Okay. So the pivoting point really comes from the central bank. Of course, the biggest central bank being the U.S. Federal Reserve. On the 19th of, 18th of March, they, dec uh, they declared that 
that we have uh, quantitative easing, which is printing of money, by about 700, 750 billion. Okay, and after that, yeah, they say that on the 23rd of March, on the exact day where the equity market started to turn, was when 750 was not enough. 750 billion was not enough. So Federal Reserve started with QE Unlimited, yeah, which is said that we'll do all it takes, we'll print whatever money is needed to turn the stock market around. Okay, so the market turned around. Let me little share with you how big this quantitative easing is. Okay, so after I share, I'll say a brief summary of the economy and the stock market. So the question I guess in our head now, is it all clear already? Yeah, how will this thing end? Okay. So I'll say the, I can offer you what my thought or what's happened. Yeah. And then we can discuss together how this thing will end. Okay. So why did, this, why did it happen like that? Firstly, as I shared, you know, the all-in stimulus, which is warding off a depression. What's coming into this, the fear is really we're heading into a depression, not just a recession, a depression. Uh, and hence, you know, the governments, the central bank acted very, very quickly. Uh, just let me give you how quick interest rate was reduced to zero percent. The amount of money that's been printed is equal to, you know, in the 08 crisis, you know, we have QE1, QE2, QE3, which spanned from 2009 to 2015. So a six years worth of quantitative easing, QE1, 2, 3. This time around took place in six weeks. Yeah. So QE1, 2 and 3, 2.5 trillion of money was printed, QE. This time around in six weeks, 2.5 trillion was also uh, printed uh, in terms of the Federal Reserve balance sheets. Uh, so this time around, everything happened very quickly. So basically, it's an all-in approach. So the, the because it was so serious, yeah, the government wanted to go all in. I'll share with you what's all in later on. And so far, what has happened? So now there's this leveling off. Right? So I think in the, this week, in the next couple of weeks, Europe and US will start to reopen its economy. What is reopening? It means like, like what we have after the lockdown, you know, we start to be able to go out. So it's like we can go out. Whether we want to go out, that's another matter. Okay, so it started to go out, people can be working, the people can be consuming, yeah, because the cases have been leveling off yeah, in many hard hit areas. However, I say this leveling off is, you know, when we usually measure areas that's been hard hit. Yeah, however, during this time, there are still many pockets of areas that are sprouts, you know, new cases happening. Yeah, and it started to increase. Yeah, so nobody really knows how this will, will pan out. Of course, with this leveling off, I say a lot of uh, government really can't wait that to open, reopen their economy because the economy is so bad that uh, if this case continues, yeah, we may be really heading into a depression. So the third one is, as I said, reopening of the economy. Right? So I think that's, uh, it gives people hope. So I think people are was, was looking past this. Well, things are bad. Uh, quarter one, quarter two for the GDP will be bad. Yeah. Employment figure will be bad. But now what people are looking at is let's look past this. You know, since the government has been helping a great deal, uh, let's look past this and it's leveling. And now we have the hope of reopening of the economy. Does it mean when economy is reopened, means the road out there is all clear? Okay, what, is, what people are trying to say uh, is they're thinking that this is a one-round match. I'll give an example of boxing. So this person that you see is Mike Tyson. So Mike, Mike Tyson is one of the best boxer of all time. One of the people who have the highest knockout, knockout rates. So you know boxing is a 12th round uh, match. So I say everybody is look, thinking that this COVID-19 is one round. It's a bit like a ball boxing match, you know, where we have Mike Tyson and match up against someone skinny and scrawny at the other side of the ring. So all the spectators saw this and said, well, this skinny person can't last one round you know, past Mike Tyson. One, one round, Mike Tyson is going to knock him out. You know, so they started to call their Grab, you know, call their Uber you know, uh, to come in 10 minutes. Yeah, because in 10 minutes, Mike Tyson is going to finish this guy off. Yeah, so it's all in approach yeah, that uh, the central government is doing and the government is doing. Yeah, thinking that 
Well, once this is all clear, it will be back to normal. Of course, the question is, what if in one round, Mike Tyson can't knock out the opponent? Yeah, and he exhausted all his energy. And round two happens, round three happens. What if you go all 12 rounds? Uh, so that's something I say nobody knows. Yeah. So I think as we extend more to round two, round three, round four, what's bear in mind, a lot has been exhausted in round one. So it's like Mike Tyson has been exhausted his energy. Come round two, he may not be the same boxer anymore. Yeah. And hence, maybe even a scrawny guy stand a chance. Okay, this is uh, putting in the context of a boxing match. Okay, so it can happen in a COVID as well. So far, I say we have only been in the liquidity crisis. So we had a recession, and then in March, the asset market fell off as well. But so far, we have not really seen any company, I would say in the headline news, going bankrupt. Yeah. So it has not been happening. Yeah. Companies, people going bankrupt, that has not happened. Yeah. So that if round two will really happen, will this happen? Yeah, I think the more this dragged on, the more likelihood we will see mass bankruptcy. Yeah. And, when it, if, and it reaches a critical mass, you'll be like what we see in 2009, when Lehman Brothers collapsed. Yeah. After Lehman Brothers collapsed, the US stock market basically fell about 50%. Okay, so that is the danger. And then for, for Trump, Trump is very, very bent. He wants to open, reopen the economy. So this has just happened. It's just in a straight time today. So Trump says U.S. must reopen even if more Americans get sick and die from COVID-19. Yeah. Why is he so anxious? You know, actually, and he's trying to disband his medical team. Yeah. He doesn't want them to give any testimony yeah, because he just wants to go ahead and reopen the economy despite the advice from his uh, medical team. Right. And uh, this was from the same uh, Straits time today. Yeah. So John Hopkins University model showing deaths could reach 3,000 per day by June. And, uh, and the University of Washington yeah, analysis showing the death, US death toll could reach 135,000. Right? So this is actually that showing that the number of cases could actually double from here, yeah, let alone reducing. Yeah. So why is Donald Trump so eager to reopen the economy? because the, re the re election is happening in November. So this was Bill Clinton. Yeah, so he said, one thing that he said is, so let's not complicate election. It's about the economy, it's stupid. Yeah, he's trying to say that if the economy don't do well, forget about your re-election. You're not going to win it. Yeah, so I think Donald Trump today really wants, he has only got six months yeah, or less you know, to, for the economy to be picking up and for him to be winning the election against Joe Biden. Yeah, so I think uh, my own fear is the eagerness to open up the economy when I'll say the testing has not really been done well yeah, will really increase the chance of a round two uh, very, uh, very much. Okay, yeah, so that's where we are. Uh, so I've given an economic outlook and a financial outlook yeah, of where we are. Uh, so I think we are still very much in the unknown. Yeah. So I say, of course, if all good, let's say, this reopen happening, this reopen is done, and the case don't climb, yeah, then it could be all clear. Yeah. Because I said, the FDA said for a drug to be found, it's probably about a year away. Uh, however, if this reopen starts, and then the cases start to come, you could go back to the original point. Yeah. We have to do this all over again for this containment. So given such an environment, how do you think we should invest? Well, I think that will uh, concern us. Okay. So investment talk about firstly asset allocation. Yeah. How should we allocate our assets? Because not all assets behave in the same way. Let's just look at two major class, equities and cash. Oh. So equities are like your strikers. You know, they will be there to give you the return. Cash is like a goalkeeper. You will not score goals. You will not give you any return. Today, I think it is very risky to be over-invested. That means you, know, you go all out, 100% invested. Or we stay under-invested. Yeah, we say, oh, let's, things are unclear. Let's stay in the sideline. Both are very dangerous. Let me share why. I think being over-invested is quite clear you know, because we are not out of the woods. If round two happens, round three happens, then I would say, you know, will the economy or the stock market be able to hold up? I think it's very much a question mark. 
How about underinvested? Why is it a risk? Yeah, since from what I say, the uncertainty seems to be so high. Because I think with this lowering of interest rate to zero and mass printing of money, the actual pressure is very high. Yeah. So now there's a lid on top. You know, this lid being the COVID-19 that's weighing heavily on top of this balloon that is high pressure. So once this lid is taken out, yeah, this balloon will explode upwards, uh, which means the stock market could explode upwards. Yeah. So I said, uh, well, by then, you know, we could be very much missing the opportunity. Yeah. And if inflation should climb, yeah, then our cash could be depleted. And we cannot find a chance to reinvest again. Because not every time, like, we waited 11 years for something like that to happen. Yeah. Would it be another 11 years of wait for economy to come down, for the equities to come down again? Oh, so I think it's, it's very risky at this moment to over-invest, not under-invest. I think we need to take the middle path to stay about, I would say, 40-50% invested in equities yeah, and rest in more conservative assets like cash and gold. Yeah. Okay, so um, next, it's about equity selection. So just now we talk about, um, so equity selection, you know, it's like going to Italian restaurants. So just now you're talking about a set allocation is like, which restaurant do I want to go? Do I go to a Mediterranean restaurant? Do I go into an Italian restaurant, a Chinese restaurant? Yeah. So if they, once you've decided to go into an Italian restaurant, like say you've decided to buy equities, to go into equities, there are also many dishes. And not all Italian dishes are the same. Yeah, there are spicy ones, there are non-spicy ones, there are sweet ones, there are sour ones. Yeah, we still need to choose. So today, I think we are in a very polarized world. Yeah, where equities are more and more not the same. I think coming out of this crisis, it will be even more polarized. Even in this crisis itself, you know, there are companies that will benefit from this COVID-19. For example, exactly what we are using today, Zoom. Yeah, Zoom is a big beneficiary of this COVID-19. Some healthcare companies, uh, some of it could be permanent. Yeah. You know, once we get accustomed to Zoom, yeah, and then in the future, I think Zoom or I would say, similar platform like Microsoft Teams you know, could actually be used much more often. Yeah. So it will disrupt global traveling. Yeah. So in the future, I said, companies may think, hey, you know, since we've gone past this period, people of different countries can converse very well. Maybe there's no need to travel. Just talk online. Yeah. I think this, you know, through this COVID, it's changed people's behavior. Like, because humans are habitual. Like before this crisis, I don't really use Zoom. Uh, or rather, I don't use Zoom at all. Uh, but now I'm so familiar with it. So once I've got accustomed to it, it become my habit, I will continue using it, even out of once this uh, lockdown is over. Yeah. So I think that will change people's behavior. So this, this I would say, disruption, which we are in even before this COVID-19, yeah, has been happening, I will say, for probably about 20 years. When was the seed planted? The seed planted when I graduated. It was the dot com. So remember, there was a dot com boom and a dot com crash in the year. Yeah. Of course, that was just a fair. However, the transformation was happening quietly. So the last 10 years, we have technological revolution. I think today, we are probably like this revolution is probably in its teenager's year. Yeah. And then with this uh, COVID 19, I think it will. Accelerate, accelerate this uh, disruption. For example, like uh, Microsoft. So the CEO of my Microsoft was sharing. He said, what took about two years of technological revolution, this time around just took two weeks. Yeah. So some of these companies are actually benefiting from it. Yeah. So when someone's benefit, someone will lose. So that's one trend we're seeing today, a uh, disruption that's happening. Secondly, we have had 10 years of slow economic growth. I think next 10 years will be more of the same. Yeah. So I'd like to I'll just share four types of companies. I'll later go through quickly into our case study. We may not have much time, but I think it's okay because I say this is a series. So I think hope next week, you know, if uh, the first part we are clear, the next part, you know, the, we, I can go more into this uh, case study, uh, which is DBS, which I'd like to be sharing. But first, let me share four types of companies first. Because this is very, very important. If you cannot identify which category the company you are going to invest falls into, yeah, you could be in for a root shock in the next 10 years. Yeah. So I say, firstly, what are mature and stable? Okay, mature and stable companies 
are those companies where their businesses are not disrupted, but they are also not disrupting other businesses. In another words, status quo. Yeah. So such companies, I say maybe in Singapore, like ST Engineering, they could fall under this type of companies. Right. And then secondly, we have cyclical growth. Cyclical growth companies, right? Their fortunes will follow the economy. When the economy is doing well, the stock price will do well. When the economy is not doing well, the stock price won't do well. And over long time, they just hover around a horizontal line, go up and down along a horizontal line. They don't really grow upwards. So for cyclical growth company, timing is very important. Yeah. If you buy, let's say, a cyclical growth company, when the economy is good, yeah. and then when the economy is bad, yeah, it's certainly going to do badly. And when the economy is good again, it basically comes back to the same point where you have previously invested. Yeah. But a lot of time has already been wasted. Yeah. So cyclical growth company, yeah, we need to buy when the economy is not doing well. Yeah. Such that the stock price is cheap. Thirdly, structural losers. Structural losers are companies that are losing from a trend. Yeah. For example, like SPH, they are actually losing market shares from its publishing business. Yeah. Because today, we use internet so much, we don't really read the newspaper that much. Oh, so SPH is losing, losing a lot of businesses. And uh, the share price of SPH has gone down 60% over the last 12 years. Okay, so I think where it's really interesting today are the structural winners. Structural winners are companies that can grow despite slow economic growth. Why? Because they're benefiting from a trend. Yeah. They're taking away market share from other companies, yeah. largely from the structural losers. So the structural winners today like Microsoft, yeah. um, Zoom, let's say, you know, that through this COVID, yeah, they actually uh, is able to catch on this trend and over time more and more people use their services. Yeah, healthcare. Yeah, could people get more health conscious through this? So I think that's about the first and most important thing is about identifying where does the company you want to invest fall into. Okay, so I'll go to my last slide, which is a case study. So today we don't have much time, probably we we'll just take about five minutes. I won't cover all. As I hope uh, if you find this interesting, I hope we can come back in two weeks' time. We will continue from where we left off. Okay, so I said uh, DBS. Uh, maybe we do this one. This does this does DBS fall into? Maybe uh, you know we take a quick uh, participation. Maybe sharing and help me to keep a lookout. You know where of this? Which type of company do you think DBS falls into? Sharon, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Yeah. So you can just type in into your chat. You know, okay, maybe so can I can... suggest, yeah, can we, can I suggest maybe yep. um, for those of you who want to participate in this, right, let's take mature and stable companies as A, so cyclical growth will be B, B for boy, and then uh, structural losers will be C, and then the last one will be D, so, so you don't need to type out the full name. Okay, I see a lot of A's now, can we? Okay, yeah, yeah. Well. okay, okay I see some B also. Okay, okay, give me a while. Uh. I see a few C's coming up, but let me see. Wow. Okay, so the rest are, very... are coming up very fast. <laughs> it's either so people are not so optimistic it's... about our biggest <laughs> bank. DBS is our, you know, DBS is the biggest cap company in Singapore. Yeah, the, the biggest, it's the biggest company in Singapore, DBS. <laughs> Okay, okay. Kate, we, yeah. I think mainly A and B. So maybe you can give the answer yeah. to them. Yes. Okay. Um, I think DBS is a cyclical growth company. Generally, banks are cyclical growth companies. Of course, some risk is would they drop into C. Um, I think banks are usually not A. Why? Because when the economy is doing well, uh, a lot of people need wants to borrow money to expand their business. You know, we want to buy our properties, second property, third properties, when I mean, our jobs are secure, we are getting pay raise. But when the economy goes into a recession, when let's say you know, we have a risk of getting job cut, the last thing you want to do is go and borrow a lot of money. But I think that's looking for uh, you know, our own pitfall yeah, to, to, fall, to fall into. Neither do companies who want to borrow a lot of money. Yeah. So at times like that, so the economy is not doing well, less people borrow money, that's number one. And secondly, 
bad debts increase yeah, because in times like that, you know, so um, the DBS CEO was sharing that uh, the, the, the profit actually went down, I think it was about uh, 29%. Yeah, that because they actually do a lot of provisioning because they see that with this economy going down, yeah, a lot of companies, especially the oil and gas companies, because oil and gas prices has collapsed in this year. Yeah. So because of that, you know, they see that a lot of companies will default in the economy in recession, and hence it will impact the companies. And bear in mind for banks now, you know, bank is highly geared, highly leveraged company. If 5% of their assets go bad, they could be close to getting bankrupt. Yeah. So you don't need a big amount of their assets to go bad. Yeah. So uh, of course, I think Singapore banks are generally quite well managed. Yeah. I think one of the better better or you know, among the best banks in the world. So credit to Singapore, I would say our corporate governance yeah, to actually breed such good banks. But still, they live in these environments yeah, where firstly, there's cyclical growth yeah, because when the economy is doing well, they will do well. When the economy is not doing too well, they will surely suffer. Okay, okay so that's, I would say that uh, my biggest, I would say the, the most probability for fall under B, uh, which is a cyclical growth company. Uh, later, I will just take a couple of minutes to share where do we not want to be in among these four. Uh, I think banks could run the risk of being a structural losers because banks require high interest rate to do well. Uh, when interest rate is depressed, uh, banks usually don't do well because what, how do banks earn money? Banks earn money by borrowing money from us. When we deposit money, banks borrow from us. And usually the floor is at 0%, which is we're already at. You know, when we deposit money in a savings account in DBS, we are paid 0.05%. Yeah. However, when they lend out, that rate depends on the economy. Yeah. For example, I was meeting a client. At the start of the year, I was thinking I was asking him to refinance his property because he was paying 2.5% on his mortgage loan. So I'm telling him yeah, the mortgage rate at the point of time was about 1.8, 1.9. And when he finally got refinanced, he said, oh, good news. You know, I got at 1.5%. Yeah. Well, guess why? Because interest rate is coming down. So as consumer, when we get a good deal, uh, you would want to be on the other side. Because when we gain, means the bank loses. Yeah. And I think with this huge amount of debts that the world government and central bank is taking on, yeah, we are probably capping the interest rates. Yeah. So I think interest rate is going to stay long for a very, very long time. Yeah. And hence, I think, banks will suffer. Yeah. You can take a look at some of these, you know, let's say look at some other banks, Stand Charts, HSBC, Credit Suisse, Citibank. All these are very well-known banks. Yeah. Just take a look at their share price. Because lack of time, I, can't, I don't share with you today, but next week, if I can, uh, two weeks time, I could share with you. In fact, they are doing, doing terribly. Yeah. So as a whole environment, it's actually very unfavorable for banks. Yeah, which is why I'm, uh, I say if you are heavily invested just in banks, I would really, ca I would really caution you, you know, to really relook at it. Yeah. Because I know Singapore, a lot, a lot of people like to invest in the banks. DBS, uh, UOB, they say, oh, you know, DBS will never collapse. And I think you are right if you're investing in it. But the bank, the, a company that don't collapse doesn't mean it will serve you well. You don't, just, you don't just want to invest in a company that don't collapse, but you want to invest in a company that makes you money. Okay, so the four types of companies, yeah, I said because of slow economic growth, I will be quite apprehensive about cyclical growth company. I will avoid at all costs structural losers because in a one way street, they are going down. And then mature and stable, we can buy, especially sometimes for good dividends. But I say over the next 10, 20 years, the type of company that will serve you best are the structural winners that can grow their profit 15, 20% per year. Yeah, over a long period of time. Okay? Yeah, so I think I just want to cover this about the business type for today. Uh, so I say DBS, in my view, don't fall into a very favorable business type. Yeah, because firstly, short term cyclical growth. Yeah, we are, six, economy is not doing well, they will suffer. Long term, they may fall into a, the, the probability of being a structural loser. Yeah, if, that, if it happens, as, as it happens for the whole banking sector, yeah, then I think uh, yeah, it will be a one-way street. Yeah, it will keep going down. Yeah. So I said, uh, I just end off my last notes. 
a lot of people when a lot of people when they invest, they like to start with the numbers, you know, which is I put number fourth and fifth, financials and valuation. I think nothing can be more wrong by starting with the numbers. I would uh, suggest, I would strongly encourage people start from the qualitative measures first. Start from the business. Yeah, like what I share with you, identify the type of business first. Yeah. Then we look at the COVID. Are they winning or losing from this? Yeah. And then we look at the competitive advantage. Today, I don't have much time to share this because I really wanted to share a bit of background of the COVID. So I think uh, I will pass it back to Shireen you know, for any questions that anybody has. Okay, thanks, Kate Lee. Okay, <laughs> Kate Lee, I, I just want to bring up something. Um, yep. So, Seung Yu, we have, a, we have a friend here, Seung Yu. He just commented in the chat group that we hope to work towards being a structural winner. So, Seung Yu, yeah. uh, <laughs> if you are with DBS, I feel that DBS is really very lucky to have someone like you. So we look forward to one day, can we one day when DBS becomes uh, one of the companies who, who will be considered as structural, win structural winners, we will invest in them, right? Uh, of course, yeah. But I say that um, <laughs> every company, no matter how good, yeah, they can be the best in their field, but they can't escape from the dynamics of the industry. Yeah. So I think it's, given where we are in, I think it's probably quite unlikely. Unless interest rate could go back to the you know, like the, the old days, yeah. But I think it's, it's quite impossible given the amount, amount of debts the whole world is in. Okay, thanks, Kiwi. Kiwi, actually, we have a question from Adrian. Okay, so mm. probably I'll just read out the question to you, then you can help to share some of your thoughts. How will the US uh, Federal Reserve recover from this debacle? Will it be another QE? And then long term, will printing money affect the dollar? Or what could be the yield effect? Uh, okay, I, I repeat the question. There are actually two. Mm. Uh, the, yes. So the first question is what? How will the Fed be impacted? Uh, the first question is how will the Fed recover from the debacle, the, the current situation? So okay. will it be another QE? So I, I believe this is like one question. And then okay. long term, will printing money affect the dollar? Or what could be the yield effects? Okay, thanks. I answered it one by one. Okay, the Fed. You don't need to worry about the Fed. You know. The Fed will always be well. <laughs> yeah, the Fed is a very unusual, I would say, organization in the whole world. Yeah, and uh, US also. So let me share with you, you know, uh, I've, I go back a bit in history. You know, after World War II, uh, Europe was, there were a lot of casualties. You know, because it was the, the World War, basically uh, it was three countries, Germany, Russia, and Japan being the aggressor. Yeah, so Japan was supposed to conquer Asia, yeah, and then Germany, Europe, yeah, and then with uh, Russia as well. So the whole world was embroiled into this World War II. Yeah. One of the com com countries that was not inside this was US. U.S. was dragged into it only with the Pearl Harbor incident. You know, uh, the Pearl Harbor is being bombed. Then they came in. But it was a very short while. Yeah, and the World War II ended. So when it ended, yeah, and then U.S. You know, got the whole world to use U.S. as the world reserve currency. Yeah, so the whole world uses U.S. dollars. Yeah, and it became even more powerful after 1970. Because after 19, before 1970, if U.S. wants to print a dollar of U.S. dollar, they need to buy gold. They can't just print at will. But after 1970s, yeah, they basically uh, abolished the Bretton uh, Wood Accord. And then they say that, well, we'll just print money at will and let the market uh, be the verdict. Yeah. Because if I print a lot of money, by right, my US dollars should depreciate. But let's not forget who, when 90% of world trade is using US dollars. Yeah, US dollar, US has the ability to print money without US dollar collapsing. Not every country has this ability. Yeah, because firstly, 90% of world trade use, use, uses US dollar. That's number one. Secondly, US borrow in US dollar, which is a very peculiar thing. Usually, if I'm a country and I want to, let's say Singapore wants to borrow money from China, China will never lend us money in Singapore dollar because we can print our money to return that money. 
they will demand that we borrow in renminbi. Such that if I keep printing money, Sing dollar will depreciate against renminbi. Yeah, and hence, hence, you'll still get back that same dollar worth. US is one of those countries which, which has the privilege of printing a lot of money and US dollar can remain as uh, powerful as it is. I'm not saying there's no decline. Yeah, even from 20 years ago to now, in the past, I think Singapore, Singapore do, US dollar to Singapore dollar was about $2, two, two to one. That means one US dollar can buy you two, two Singapore dollars. Today, it's about 1.4. So clearly, US dollar has weakened. Yeah. Oh, so I said, the Federal Reserve has this printing machine yeah, at its basement. So it can keep printing money yeah, to get US out of, out of this uh, crisis. Yeah, and because the whole world has to support this uh, US dollar. Yeah. So I said, uh, in fact, they can continue to do it for a long, long time. Yeah, printing of money. Yeah. However, there are certain rules that they need to play by. So that you, the Federal Reserve cannot print money to give people. They can only give out loans. And they're not supposed to lose money. So let's say they, they, they cannot give out loans to companies that are about to, about to go bankrupt. Yeah, they can't do that. They can only give loans to uh, usually governments, US governments, yeah, which will not go bankrupt. And maybe the very high-rated kind of bonds. Yeah. So the first question is, uh, the Federal, Federal Reserve don't need to save itself. Yeah. It will always be fine. Yeah. Because it's operating in US, using US dollars, yeah, which has got unlimited power to print any amount of money it wants. Okay. So what is the repercussion? So just I shared briefly. Oh, so I think the first repercussion is uh, US dollar, I think, could be weaker. Yeah, coming out of this, after this crisis, yeah, because of the amount of money they have printed. And second repercussion is interest rate will probably have to stay very low. Yeah, because if they increase the interest rates, yeah, they have to pay interest on those loans yeah, that the US government is holding. Yeah. So it's a two separate entity, yeah. US government and the central bank. So the borrower is US government. The lender is the central bank. Yeah. So the central bank can lend unlimited amount of money to the US government. Okay, so I think that's one, the other impact yeah, where interest rate will likely stay low for a long period yeah, because of this uh, huge amount of debt. Yeah, so I think these are the main repercussions. Yeah. Would that be inflation? Of course, one fear of repercussion is inflation. Because by right, when you print a lot of money, it should create inflation. But uh, we did not see that. Like, oh, the QE from 2009 to 2015, right? A lot of money has been printed as well. But there was no inflation. Yeah, or rather, very insignificant inflation. Yeah. Because there's the other elements, which is called velocity of money. Yeah. Because when, every, when uh, people transact, let's say if I buy from A and I hand him money, then my $1 becomes $2 in the economy. And when A sells to B, another dollar is creating in the economy. So when the economy is booming and there's the velocity, the move, the velocity of money is fast. Yeah, in fact, the economy will have a lot of money because it's circulating. But when the, it's sitting with the bank and the bank don't use it, don't lend it up, then the Federal Reserve could be printing a lot of money. Yeah, but the money don't move. It's just stuck at the bank. Uh, so it doesn't create inflation as well. Of course, with the technological revolution, uh, it further enhances productivity and reduces inflation. So my own take is, I think inflation in the near to midterm will probably won't be a concern, yeah. but rather we could be a, a greater concern could be deflation, yeah, which is prices going lower, yeah, because humans are habit habitual. Coming out of this, we really don't know how how will everybody behave. Yeah. Will the thirty million people who file for unemployment claim now become more cautious? Wow, I can't anyhow spend. I better save some money, and the more people save, the less they spend the slower the economy will be. Yeah. And hence, that will further push down inflation. Oh. So I think, to not sum up, inflation is one possible consequence. I think it's low. Yeah. Interest rates, yeah. it will be a consequence to hold the interest rate low. Yeah. And thirdly, uh, yeah, probably a weakening of US dollars. Yeah. So that is what I see. Okay. Thanks, Kikwi. Thank you very much for the sharing. Uh, Kate, I I would just like to ask because um yes we we have a time constraint, 
but because there are a few questions coming up, can I suggest that um, we answer one last question? Okay, sure. At least on this question, we could we could uh, keep it, yeah, and then we uh, we could answer it the next round, yeah. If if you know if there are not too many in the next session. Okay, thanks, thanks, Kate. So um, because there are two questions, I feel they are quite related. Because from mm. Brian, uh, any thoughts in investing in precious metals or alternative assets to mitigate the impact from uh, QE? And then because okay. Sharon, Sharon, our friend Sharon, also asked, um, how about gold? So probably okay. you can answer this together. Okay. Um, the other time, the last time round, when money was printed, gold jumped. Right. Um, so the last time when QE started was in the uh, end of the crisis, yeah, in December 2009. Yeah, and gold basically from the bottom, yeah, I think it was about November 2009, to the peak in uh, 2011, gold jumped 250%. Okay? Yeah, it was of printing of money. So I think a lot of people may be, a lot of people may be thinking, well, wow, this time around, you know, a lot more money has been printed. Will gold jump even more? Well, I think uh, let's, well, we can use it as a, as a, as a say, a gauge. You know, last time this happened, this was a consequence. Yeah. This time this happened, but the same consequence happened. But we've got to understand what's the underlying reason of gold. Yeah. What is the purpose of gold? Okay, the, one of the primary driver of gold price, uh, I mean, there are others as well, but I say one of the primary ones, it's real, in real interest rates. Real interest rates means our interest rate that we are seeing minus away inflation. Yeah. So when inflation is, uh, so when real interest rate is low, gold will actually do very well. Why is that so? Because the competing asset of gold is cash. Yeah. The cash that we are all holding, putting in the bank. When interest rate is very high, the opportunity cost of holding gold is very high because gold don't pay interest. Well, if I hold real cash, fiat money, I get interest. So if interest rate is 5%, 10% today, I won't want to hold gold because I get 5%, 10% putting my money in the, in the bank. But if interest rate is low but inflation is high, because gold is a form of currency that is limited in supply. Whereas fiat currency, nowadays government can print at will. Yeah. So let's say uh, in the times of inflation, uh, where inflation is higher than interest rates, then gold will be very valuable yeah, because gold can hedge against inflation. Oh, so I said uh, that is one of the primary function of gold yeah, other than a safe haven asset. Yeah, so I think we got to really see that with this. Interest rate, I think we are quite clear. I think we are going to have a low interest rate period for quite a long while. Okay, the second question which is still unknown, how about inflation? Because last time when money was printed, I think there was expectation that inflation is going to fly. And hence, people buy gold. But this time round, I say that it's still good to hold gold. That could still happen because interest rate is already rock bottom. Uh, however, I will stay, uh, still be measured. Yeah. We don't want to just take the history as an example and then now 100% we are in gold. Yeah. Because if you are in a deflation period, yeah, then gold may not be doing so well. Yeah. So I say that at the current juncture, I still think gold, gold is a good hold. Because as a safe haven assets, yeah, if things turn south, yeah, gold could be holding up. Yeah. And usually, I say, with, with more money is being printed, yeah, there may be fear of inflation and, and gold could be at a hedge. Yeah. So I said, really be balanced. I would say where I would like to be in is structural growth companies. That would be great. Yeah. Some of the mature and stable companies that give us uh, a dividend yield, uh, some gold and some cash. Yeah. So I think that would be a a good place to be in. So I hope I answered the question. So I think yeah, let's not just take 08 situation or 2009 to 2011 situation yeah, as a repeat. Yeah. But rather uh, keep some goal. Mm, yeah, but don't, don't, in investment is like that. Let's not bet everything on one, one area. Yeah. The environment can change. And hence, if we are all, we are, we are too fixed on our idea that this will be good and we are all in, yeah, we may not be able to get out. So that's uh, my thoughts. Uh. So I think about probably 10, 15% or 20% of gold seems quite a, a good amount that is allocation at this moment. Shereen? 
Okay, thank you very much, Kami. <laughs> Thanks for sharing with us for the past, I think, 15 minutes. Now I can take over My the pleasure. data back. <laughs> thank you. Okay, um, before, before, before we end the night, I just hope to take this opportunity to share with you, all of you, the snapshot of Unicorn services. Let me explain why, because I believe that uh, among all of you who have been with us for the past close to one hour, maybe some of you in your mind currently is that you would like to take action, but you do not know who to go to or how to start. Therefore, um, I just hope to avail one avenue for you to consider. And then for those of you who do not belong to this category, I just hope that you can bear with me for a few more minutes. I'll just go through that in a very brief manner for you to understand more. Okay, so let me just share screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, Unicorn, we were established in 2011. And then currently, we have 70 licensed consultants. And all of us together, we are serving 7,000 households in Singapore. And we are also managing about 350 million of asset under management. In Unicorn, we are client-centric needs focused. This also explains why um, you will not be experiencing any pushy product selling from us. Because in Unicorn, we do not do roadshows or cold call. We believe that clients should go through proper education and process of allowing us to understand more about them before a good advice can be tailor-made for clients' needs. And then the other part about our Unicorn is also we take the fee-based approach. So you pay us only when you see values in what we can deliver to you. We believe that this is a key factor in nurturing a long-term relationship should always be a win-win situation via real values given. And last but not least, for Unicorn service, okay, I'm just going to show you a simple chart. It's quite self-explanatory, therefore I will not go through with you one by one. For those who want to have an overview of what kind of services we provide, and then also who are our external partners in delivering the service, you can just take a read for uh, maybe just 15 seconds. And as you are reading through, if at it, in any case, you would like to find out more about what we do, please, please feel free to go back to the friend who invite you here today. That's all that I have for you. Uh, and for those who are looking forward to the next episode of the Grey Rhino Show, I'm happy to announce to you that the next show will be on the 20th of May, same time at 8 p.m. So uh, our colleagues will be, because you are currently in our mailing list, so we will keep you updated about the invite for the next show. And at the same time, when you receive the link for today's session, there is also a feedback form attached. So we would very much appreciate it if you can spend just one minute or two after uh, the session today to give us your most genuine and sincere feedback because we take all this feedback seriously and we really hope to deliver a better and better Grey Rhino show in time to come. Okay, thank you very much for being with us today. Stay tuned to the next episode. Have a good night, stress. Bye-bye.